when I think about uh, 1969 and I look back, you know, the hair right now on the back of my neck is rising because I remember those days was uh, really the focus of what we had been preparing for after President Kennedy had really charted us as NASA to try to send somebody to the moon and bring them back safely. And really, when uh, the words were said, you know, it just it rang a bell with me after all those years and the hard work and the sweat and the blood, looking at all the problems that we had been through. So there's no question, if, if you go back and look in history, and I'm a history buff, by the way, and, and I look at what we've done, really, with the lunar landing, I think, I don't know of anything that, that's greater than that. Now, you think about wars, and you think about back in history, and a lot of the things that's happened. But if you think about human endeavor, I don't know of anything when you talk about exploration that matches that. Well, we have to go back a few years if you want to look at what made the program successful. And I have to give the German team really the credit. And I started with a lot of them in the early 50s. Of course, we were with the Army in those days. And of course, 1960, we went to NASA. But a lot of the work had begun Von Braun was always interested in space travel. He didn't care a thing about military. He didn't care a thing about ballistic missiles and so forth. But, of course, he came over here with uh, the paper clip when we brought the people over after World War II, the German team, when they came here to Redstone, and started uh, just extending the V-2, the old V-2 rocket that they had built. In fact, he was the key person in that. And we went to the Redstone missile. Then after that, that was uh, about 175 nautical mile ballistic missile, and after that was a Jupiter missile, which was an intermediate range ballistic missile, some 1,500 miles. We all worked on that. Well, then the idea came up with, he really wanted to build something big that he could go into space and carry some heavy payloads. So we started looking at how does one cluster, we took the tanks from the Redstone, 70 inches in diameter, we took the, the Jupiter, which was our intermediate range, intermediate range ballistic missile, it had 105 inch in diameter, and then we clustered those. And then we was able to cluster an engine. We had eight engines and nine tanks. Now think about how do you get the propellants? And for, for the benefit, uh, let's say, of people, they may not know how a rocket engine works, but you have to have a fuel and an oxidizer. Where you go up into space, there's no air up there like an airplane or a jet engine would require. So we carry oxidizer, and most of the time we use liquid oxygen. And the fuel can be different things. Your automobile uses gasoline. Back in those days, we used alcohol, 75% alcohol is our fuel. And then we went to kerosene and RP-1, or, or jet fuel. But we had to design the system, and we clustered the tanks, and then you had to manifold all these systems to get both the oxidizer and the fuel to the individual engine. Well, if you got eight engines, you can imagine what a plumber's nightmare you had. And you had cross-feed, you worried about one engine, would do something to the engine adjacent to it, whether it was the feed system, or it was vibrations, or whatever. So we went through a lot of testing to do that. In addition to clustering the engines, then you had to pressurize the tanks. Once you start taking the propellants out, if you don't continue to put the pressure in there, the tank will collapse. So we had a pressurization system we had to design. And we went through a lot of tests here at our center to develop these systems. We did a lot of the analysis and everything. In fact, I had worked in propulsion. And that's why I keep referring to the engines and the propulsion system, because that, that's the experience I had uh, acquired back during those years. Well, after we flew, we flew some 10 of those, the old Saturn I, Saturn IIbs, after we clustered them. And we went to a second stage, and we went to a, a high-energy system so far as the engine performance, and it used liquid hydrogen as the fuel still liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. Now you say, why do you use liquid hydrogen? If you remember your chemistry, well, it has a molecular weight of two, and in terms of performance, it gives you the highest performance. And we, that was new to us in those days. No one had used liquid hydrogen as a fuel. You gotta recognize the liquid oxygen is at minus 297 degrees Fahrenheit, cryogenic. The liquid hydrogen is at minus 421 degrees. Well, that brings in a lot of problems. How do you maintain that? You don't have a vacuum bottle or something. You have insulation you have to be concerned with. In addition, you have problems of getting the propellant at the right conditions for the engine. You, in your car, your car does what? You use gasoline, you have a carburetor, you take air from the atmosphere, you atomize the gasoline, and you, you force it into your combustion chamber. You have a spark plug to ignite it. Well, it's very similar in a rocket engine, okay? 
We have pumps to do the, the same thing, where we take the oxidizer and the fuel, we ignite it a lot of times with a spark, a spark igniter we call it. And then, but we have what we call an injector, a faceplate, that atomizes instead of a carburetor. It, in fact, it's a lot simpler. We don't have pistons like you have in, a, in an automobile or internal combustion engine. So, but you get into problems, if you're familiar with some of the problems you have with your car, sometimes you turn the switch off and you hear a pin, and it won't stop, it's sort of dieseling. Well, we call that combustion instability. And in the case of uh, a lot of the, the hydrocarbon engines, you can get involved with that where you don't get complete combustion, and it'll actually sit there and destroy itself. It goes into the various modes, vibration modes, and it'll sit there and destroy itself. And as we move from Saturn 1, now I want to make the point, as we go to Saturn 5, which is what we use for the Apollo, the S1C, the first stage, used five F1 engines. Each, each engine had a thrust of something like one and a half million pounds. So we had five of those, which gave you seven and a half million pounds thrust. Well, you needed that to get all this mass off. And it used liquid oxygen, and that was a new engine now. It's a huge engine. But we had all kinds of problems in the early days, namely this combustion instability. Now, if you can envision an injector plate some three feet in diameter with all these holes in it, uh, we had problems with the thing. In fact, we spent over $30 million, had some of the best brains in the country helped us on this thing, had teams working it. Some people, in fact, with the uh, Presidential Scientific Committee said you'd never get an engine that large to run. The Russians, nobody ever built an engine that large, and therefore we were kind of the first one. But Combustion instability almost brought us to our knees. We set up special teams, and uh, with our contractor, Rocketdyne, which is Division North American back then, and we had people from NASA out there, and I participated in a lot of that myself personally. But a lot of work was done, and to make a long story short, if you visualize a flat, place, a flat plate injector, and we put baffles in there, and you wanted to be sure that, uh, that it could attenuate or dampen any kind of oscillations. Well, then what we would do is put a little bomb. We would put a little bomb in there and set that bomb off during the firing. And we'd do this on a test stand. In fact, we used to do a lot of tests right here in our single engine test stand out in our test area. And we'd set this bomb off and see how long it would take to dampen. And if it would dampen with the various configurations, then we felt like we had a dynamically stable injector. And eventually we were able to do that, but it took months and months and months. To do that. In addition, you have a problem with pumps. When you think about turbo machinery because we take the propellants from the tank and then we're driving them into the combustion chamber at high pressures. Uh, the combustion chamber pressure on the F1 engine was about a thousand pounds per square inch, which was really unknown in those days. The highest we'd been is something like four five hundred pounds per square inch. So as you go up in pressures, that means there's more fatigue, more problems associated with, with your turbines, with your pumps, your impellers, etc. So all those problems had to be worked, had to be looked at. And we, we blew up a lot of locks, liquid oxygen pumps, a lot of pumps we blew up. And there's nothing like that. If you can visualize when you have liquid oxygen, you know about welding, and they use acetylene. And when he's cutting a piece of steel there, what does he do? He presses the button for more oxygen there. And that's the thing that gives you the high heat. Of course, we've got oxygen there. If you get a fire going, look out because it's gone. Everything around it's gone. There's nothing as serious as a liquid oxygen pump explosion. And we had many of those in those days. But we had bearing problems, we had turbine blade problems that we had to overcome. And there was many years that we, that we worked. And I, when I say we worked, we NASA with our contractors and then bringing in consultants. We had academia assisting us and helping us in all these areas. It was uh, long hours, I mean, blood and sweat, on the road a lot, traveling. We had our test stands for the F-1 at Edwards Air Force Base, where we land the space shuttle now. Had big test stands out there. We had explosions there and wrecked the stands sometimes. And eventually, we was able to do testing here at Marshall. And then when we clustered the engine, we actually did the cluster tests out here, what we call the S-1C. That was the first stage of Saturn. And we clustered the engines and did all st static fire. In fact, built the first stages here, brought all the hardware here, brought the engines. And we did all the cluster tests here initially. And eventually, once we froze the design, and then we brought Boeing in as our prime contractor to, to, to actually pick up and do the design in New Orleans and build the hardware down there. Now, we would barge all the hardware. You imagine 33 foot in diameter. The tank was 33 feet in diameter, huge with the five engines. 
the second stage, again, used a, a new engine, what we call the J2 engine. It was a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engine. The one I had mentioned earlier was 15,000 pounds thrust. This one had around 200,000 pounds. Now, we had five of them, which gave us a million pounds in the second stage. And what you do, you'd burn the first stage for about 130 seconds. First stage was separate and drop in the ocean. The second stage would go ignited, ignited, and it would burn for some five or six minutes. And then all you're doing is adding impulse or energy to the whole system. And of course, the payload up there is what you're interested in. And we had problems with the second stage. Uh, a lot of problems in terms of propellant conditioning, as I mentioned earlier. You have to have the propellants at the right temperature and pressure for the pumps. And again, we're at cryogenic temps, like I said earlier. So the pumps don't cavitate. And we did a lot of work. We did the testing on it and I, at our Mississippi test facility, which is Stennis Space Center today. I spent a lot of time myself personally in Downey, California with, with the first what we call the T-Bird. That was a second stage test bird. We call it the bird because it's going to fly. But we did a lot of testing down there. But what they did after they built it, we had a milestone we committed with Congress and with everybody to get ready for the, the lunar mission. So we actually shipped this hardware. Well, Von Braun, this is one of the funny stories with Von Braun. He invites all the, the big shots from Washington, the administrator and all of them, and they all fly into Gulfport, Mississippi, and our test site is near Picayune, Mississippi. And the, the base manager there was Jack Balt. He was our base manager, so what does he do? He gets the highway patrol in the state of Mississippi and also in the state of Louisiana, and they set a world record driving from the airport up to the, stand, up to the, the, the site there for the test. Of course, everybody was all uptight because that was going to be the first test on the second stage. Well, we, we finally got a good test off that night. Made many tests down there, but eventually what happened? Well, they overpressurized the tank and the tank was destroyed. We had an investigation, we knew what was the problem was, we fixed the problem, went on. Third stage was built by McDonnell Douglas, Huntington Beach, and their testing was up in uh, Sacramento. They had a test facility up there and had a single engine, the one engine. Like I mentioned on the second stage, the J2 engine, they had one. And eventually they had a problem up there. It was on the engine. So Von Braun, he bars KSC's airplane, and there was eight of us to go out on that thing. It was a, a Lockheed Jetstar. Well, here's a young engineer, never been on a little jet engine, and a jet airplane and everything. And we went from Huntsville, Redstone out here, to uh, Van Nuys, to our contractor, and then flew on up to Sacramento. Went out to test stand, we set up an investigation, see what we need to do. And so we got ready to come back, and uh, they had a steward on there, and they were lucky contractors. But I asked the young fellow on there, I said, can you tell me something about these jet engines, what the thrust is or something? I said, I got a son, I'd like to tell him about this. And of course, I was just like a kid with a new toy being on this airplane. So he went off, in about 10 minutes, he came back, and he gave me this little brochure. And it had all the description of what the airplane would do, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, the last page in there was a certificate. And uh, it says, this is, this is to certify that Alex A. McCool, Jr., blah, 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 date so-and-so did fly in Sacramento, altitude so-and-so, ground speed of so-and-so, and the pilot signed it. Well, I looked down there, who was the pilot? Warner Von Braun, and I looked up, and here he was coming from, from the cockpit up there, and he had a big old grin on his face. And he wasn't checked out to fly, you know, jet airplanes, but It was really, you know, to be able to do all this and us work with all the counterparts, let's say at, our, at JSC at Houston, our friends down there, and then integrate all of this, including all the work at Kennedy Space Center. Because then you got all the launch complex to deal with, you got all the propellant systems that you got to fill and drain the tanks, etc. You got all the launch commit criteria to deal with, all the electrical systems to deal with. So it was a big job that went in NASA, we all had to really get involved with. And it was very challenging, a lot of meetings, a lot of travel, long hours. Uh, Von Braun was in the middle of all of it. You know, he'd come around before we'd get down there, like for our first flight, which was what we call AS-501. That was our first one. And uh, eventually it flew. We didn't have any problems on it. Second flight, we did have some problems. 
Uh, in the first stage, we saw what we call pogo. Pogo is a is a vertical oscillation. Uh, it can what what happens there is the engine's natural frequency. It was around five cycles, or five hertz. Very very low frequency, but it can couple with the structural frequency, and it can it can be bad or it could be uncomfortable for the astronauts because you're actually sitting there. So we had to come up with a design fix and to attenuate that, and we were able to do that through the pre valves and all you had was cavities there that one could attenuate. And in fact, today on Space Shuttle, we have what we call pogo suppressors. So that was a new thing to us. In addition, on the second stage now, uh, we had some, some igniter lines that carried fuel. And these were braided bellows, and the braided was to allow them to articulate, to move and everything. And uh, we noticed that the, one of the engines shut down during flight. And this is on our second Saturn V. Now, this is scary. You know, you just started flying. And uh, pretty soon, the other, in just a second or so, another engine shut down. So there, there were three engines left, and it continued to burn. It burned longer because the propellant was still there. And you, we still got the velocity. And, of course, the guidance system was able to correct for this. And eventually, they separated. And then the third stage, it went into a, a low-Earth orbit. And it was to have restarted, uh, and it, it couldn't restart. Well, we found out it was the same kind of problem. Here's this fuel line. So we was able to go back and, and ascertain what had happened. And we, when we'd been testing, you know, test stands with this engine, and here's this articulated line, and it could get air that would liquefy and actually build up the ice. And what you have, if y'all are familiar with what we call vortex shedding, when you have bellows or something flow there, it actually would set up an oscillation. It's a little bit like, if y'all familiar, like a, a chimney or a, a smokestack. The wind going around that will set up vortices and get it moving, or bridges will do that. So you try to design to stay away from that. But that's, that's exactly what happened. We didn't know that. We were able to test in a vacuum and prove that you didn't get the liquefaction to attenuate it, so we actually got rid of the, the braid. But uh, on the next flight now, which was kind of interesting, they decided to go ahead and uh, and fly, you know, man. These were not man flights, and that was a big one. I remember we sat uh, with a whole had all the corporate presidents here and all the key people. It was a meeting here at our center. And all the people from Washington came down. Do we fly man on the next mission? And they decided to go ahead and do that. And then after that, then they of course went around the moon, and uh, and then of course Frank Borman's thing that he did before Christmas. And the one that really sticks with me is uh, the guys on Christmas Eve, when they went back to, I'm getting goosebumps now thinking about it, they went to the book of Genesis, and uh, Frank starts out in the beginning, you know, God created heavens and earth, and the guys actually, uh, they, each one of the crew members, they read parts of the creation account from the Bible. Now, today, maybe that's a no-no, I don't know, but uh, it really sticks with me to this day, because it was Christmas Eve, and here they'd gone around the moon, first time now, anybody. And of course, that was a precursor for us being able to go to the moon. You know, we weren't sure what was involved in that. There was and uh, he would just, let me use the words, walk the talk, okay? You know what I mean by that? He would come around, you know, you, he would call or have a secretary call and say he's coming over. He'd just show up. He'd come look at all the drawing boards. Or what do you got going on? Why don't you design it this way or that way? But he was a people person. He was really interested. And I, and I try to do that today myself. I learned that from him. You've got to get around where the people are doing the work. I mean, sitting in your office or sitting in meetings. Well, he did a lot of that. Don't misunderstand. But he always used the opportunity to get out and talk to the people, people on the floor or in the shops. How are you doing it? Won't you do it this way? Brilliant person. Very brilliant. Had all kinds of uh, ideas, you know, good technical mind. But if you go back to his early experience, and I think that's, that's the key here, is keeping his hands dirty. In other words, when he was young, you know, he was involved in testing himself. He was involved in design. He, he had learned it the hard way, just like, you know, working on your car. You're going to learn yourself when you skin your knuckles and everything. He had done that. He had learned the hard way himself. And he sort of preached that to us, that it's hands-on. Do your things hands-on. And I think that's what made our center so great over the years is the hands-on work that we would do in-house, uh, capabilities that we have developed over the years. But Von Braun always, you know, he exuded this idea of teamwork. 
Now, he had, you know, a lot of the key people, the Germans, and they were our bosses. And, but they worked very well with us. They just, they were glad to have us. We was all part of the team. There wasn't any partitions between us. You could say what you want. They wouldn't take it personal. He's always building up the team, building up the people. But Von Braun was able to do things like that. He was able to go to Congress, you know, and, and articulate, you know, NASA's needs. He was probably, the charisma he had, you know, he knew his, he really knew everything. He was just so good. And you got to think now, here's this guy when he was in Germany in his days, in his early 20s, he was the technical director. So there's no question if you go read the history and everything. Well, this, this country, I think if you go back and look, we were so fortunate in getting him plus all his team. That's not to say that the Russians didn't get quite a few. They got a lot of production and manufacturing. But I believe that this country did well by getting him here and his team and how he was able to help all of us and he always had in his mind, you know, going to the moon, going out into space, space exploration. He always, he would talk about that over and over and over. And history has proven that. If you look back now, you look at Skylab, I mean, he was heavily involved in that, which is really our first space station in this country. But he was somebody, I tell you, that you just enjoyed being around. He just uh, seemed like he was just a good coach, good team leader, uh, Excellent, you know, in terms of working with people. They bring congressmen. You know, we've had presidents come here, and he'd always be there with them, and he just did so well. I think, to me, that uh, the lunar landing has probably been one of the greatest things that man has ever done. No question, in terms of exploration, it is the greatest. But it took thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It took a lot of money. It took a lot of blood and sweat of people prepared to do that. There was a lot of safety issues that had to be addressed, a lot of unknowns, a lot of things that we did that were new, it was different. So there's no question uh, the culmination of actually landing and bringing them back it was getting them back safely once we had splash down and, and recovery and all that. And that was the time to kind of take your breath and take a deep breath and then celebrate.